Phonica. That is how you say hello in Tamil, which is the oldest spoken language in the world. That language has clearly stood the test of time. In this lesson, we'll discuss a couple ways in which flip-flops test time. We know that they are enabled by clock edges, but how is that actually achieved? One approach is shown here, which has a very simple setup. A clock waveform signal is branched. One wire goes straight to an AND gate. The other passes through a NOT gate before reaching the AND gate. What's the point of this? One of the basic Boolean algebra rules tells us that a literal ANDed with its complement always equals zero. So this AND gate should always be outputting zero, right? Almost. But don't forget about gate delay. It takes a little extra time for this B signal to come through the NOT gate. Let's zoom in to one clock cycle on this timing diagram. The A signal is effectively identical to the original clock. The B signal is the complement of the clock signal, but delayed slightly. As a result, there's this brief sliver of time where both A and B are high and thus the output of the AND gate is high. For the rest of the time, that signal is low. I decided to name that signal EN. It should be easy to guess why I did that. I can take that signal and pass it in as the enable input to a gated latch. This schematic is identical to the gated latch we explored a couple lessons ago. But now I'll replace that enable switch with the wire leaving this AND gate. Voila! I now have a D flip-flop. Would this flip-flop be positive or negative edge triggered? We can answer that from the timing diagram. Only in a brief instant after the positive edge of the clock does enable equal 1. Therefore, this is positive edge triggered. This approach for identifying clock edges is satisfying in its simplicity, but isn't actually used within flip-flop chips. What problems do you notice? One problem is that this enabled period needs to be long enough for the D signal to pass through these two layers of NAND gates. It is unlikely that a single NOT gate would have enough delay. So an extra buffer would be needed on the B wire. In fact, I used to have students imitate this in a hardware lab by using five NOT gates in sequence but it is then easy to overshoot and have too long of a delay. In a flip-flop, we want Q to be able to change just once in a clock cycle, not multiple times. With too long of an enabled window, a fluctuating D input could cause Q to fluctuate as well. The good news is that there is a more reliable method. That method is called master-slave. It is an unfortunate name, but it's the technical name for this setup and is commonly used in various technological applications. In recent years, various other terms have started being used, such as controller peripheral, master minion, and primary secondary. No matter what you call it, it describes the behavior of one device causing changes in following devices. A master slave D flip-flop is shown here, made of a clock, a not gate, and two gated D latch devices. Recall that the gate level schematic of a gated D latch looks like this. The idea is that the Q output of the latch will match the D input once the latch is enabled. Let's examine this timing diagram, which shows the input D, intermediate signal Y, and final output Q. While the clock is high, the master latch is enabled and the slave latch is disabled due to this NOT gate inverting the high signal. This means that any changes in D are almost immediately passed through the master latch, but not the slave latch. This is why, during this high clock period, the Y value changes, but the Q value stays the same. But then the clock drops low. This now disables the master latch and enables the slave latch. As a result, the Y value can change no more, and the Q value changes to whatever the current Y value is. 
these fluctuations in D have no effect because Y cannot change and Q has no direct connection to D. Taken as a whole, this is a negative edge triggered D flip-flop. Whatever the value of the input is just before that falling clock edge will be the value that is passed through to the output. If we instead want a positive edge triggered flip-flop, we can simply move the knock gate to the master enable line. This next slide looks intimidating at first, but have no fear. It is identical to the layout on the previous slide, just now at the gate level. The boxes shown here are each a D latch. The master latch feeds into the slave latch. This clock signal functions as the enable and passes through a knock gate before enabling the slave latch. We said before that this master-slave approach is more dependable than the simple gate delay method, but there are still some important specifications to consider. The clock frequency must be slow enough, or in other words, the clock period long enough, for the D signal to propagate through these two layers of NAND gates. Related, the D signal must be at the desired value a little before and a little after the clock pulse in order for its instruction to be read. Also, the changes in Q will not truly occur exactly at the negative edge. There will be a delay through these two layers of NAND gates. Those sorts of real-world limitations are unavoidable. We just saw how a D flip-flop is constructed. Now let's look at JK. What a relief. The schematics are actually very similar. Pause the video for a minute and see if you can identify any differences. First, there are two instruction inputs, J and K, rather than just D. Previously, D functioned like J, and it was also branched into an OK to serve as the K signal. But now we have K, and it feeds straight into this bottom NAND gate. Second, those leading NAND gates now have three inputs. The Q prime output loops all the way back up here and the Q output loops all the way back down here. This is what allows for the toggle operation. When toggling, the start of the circuit needs to know what the current outputs are. The last function I want to show you is asynchronous inputs. Here we see another negative edge trigger JK flip-flop, but now with preset and clear. Notice that these inputs have a direct line to the output. Their operation might be easiest to see when we think of these NAND gates as invert OR gates. When preset is activated with a zero signal, this invert OR is guaranteed to output one, regardless of what any of its other inputs are. So Q becomes one, no matter what the clock is doing or any of the other signals. The schematic explains why the asynchronous inputs are usually active low. I suppose you could make them active high, but then you'd need to add in an extra knock gate. This other wire branching off from Q forces this NAND gate to output 1, regardless of its other inputs. In effect, it cuts off any possible reset signal coming from the master latch. This prevents the possibility of preset turning on Q while a separate reset signal also turns on Q prime. This asynchronous clear input is the mirror image of preset, so it causes just the opposite effects. Remember that these flip-flops should never have both preset and clear activated at the same time. What would happen? As you can see in the schematic, both Q and Q prime would equal one. That doesn't break the circuit, but it doesn't make any logical sense. Are you expected to memorize these circuits? Of course not. But now I hope the magic of edge triggering is cleared up. Also, you should pay attention to the general master-slave layout. The theme of one device's behavior controlling another's is a common one.